Uh, we're going to be talking today about three things mostly. Uh, and that is when you're doing repairs on, on radios, and we're going to be using a rather simple one as an example of one of your old uh, AAA 5s, all American awful 5s. <laughs> and uh, if you go to the next slide, it just sort of summarizes what we're going to be talking about, and that is we're going to examine all three of the tools of the trade here, and uh, and two of them are diagnostic, the meter and the oscilloscope, and one and two of them are are for supplying signals and power to the. Uh, thing under test. Now the thing we have under test is a triple or is a double A five radio that's been here before. I think I had this here before about five years ago. And I still have the radio and I still have to drill the holes in the Catalan panel that goes in the front across here. But anyhow if you go to the uh, the next uh, slide please we have on the left uh, the, the sources of signal and the source of power, and I was fully intending to bring my isolation transformer to show you safe power, and it disappeared somehow. I had it here yesterday, and I showed it to somebody, and now I don't know where it is. So uh, I have no idea. Uh, and, and, and so I'll show you a safety backup thing that I do if I don't have an isolation transformer. On the other side, we have a voltmeter and an oscilloscope. Those are the diagnostic tools we'll use. And uh, you can do most uh, all of the tests of, of most radios with just those two instruments. And if you have a good signal generator and you know that you can apply power to the radio, <clears throat> There's a lot of a lot of safety checks you have to make before you can apply power, and uh, and it's a, and it's especially true if you don't have an isolation transformer and it might be a hot chassis radio. This is not a hot chassis radio. It's one that was uh, made in uh, about 1946, I think, or 45, <clears throat> and then by that time. The underwriters' labs were pretty strong about uh, keeping uh, chassis from being tied directly to the power line. So this one has a floating chassis, but it does have some leakage to the power line, and I'm hoping that that leakage is not enough to set off uh, a GFCI protection, which I don't think this hotel has that anyhow, so, so I think we're safe. I'll probably just get electrocuted instead. So let's, let's look at our objects here. Uh, first of all, the, the signal generator. Uh, the, the one I'm going to be using is a crone uh, height, and it will make a square triangular or, or sine waves, and you see the sine waves on the scope right now. Uh, this is the frequency control. There's an amplitude control. And uh, if you have to make a gross change in frequency, you can always go back to another band. And this is a much lower frequency. And we'll go back up to the high frequency here. This is the highest frequency we have all the way up to here. So what was interesting is I changed frequency and this thing changed in distance between peaks. So this is obviously not reading frequency, it's reading time. And that's the important thing about a scope. 
the ordinary oscilloscope, the an analog the, to a uh, type of oscilloscopes at the very least, uh, always show you something versus time. And, uh, and, and you have to sometimes interpret that in terms of frequency. Like if you're used to uh, thinking of a super het as having an incoming frequency, a local oscillator frequency, and then a resulting intermediate frequency. Uh, if you are using a scope to check those, it's going to tell you not the frequencies, but the time between crests. And if you have a small or large uh, calculator or, or your cell phone, you can convert one to the other because the conversion is rather easy. Next slide. Our victim, our, our AA5 receiver, is uh, a Teletone 5 tube, standard AA5. Um, and uh, it does seem to work a little bit, but it has some problems. And uh, I have gone through the problems at least once or twice before. Uh, but it's developed other problems since then. We will take it out of the chassis or out of the cabinet first. And that, and that was easy. It's a it's a slant front thing with a loop antenna, and there's a, another antenna that's fastened to the loop through a little capacitor and a, and a turn of wire. And the whole, the whole thing uh, is supposed to work on the AM broadcast band only. So there's not a whole lot to it. And we can actually turn it on and try it. Or we can go through some diagnostic things first and learn a little bit more about our other tools. Next slide. Of course, what you can always do is get one of these Hickok things that are one made by Ryder. And uh, what they do is they are a complete radio in themselves and they're broken up in sections. And you can use any of these sections to substitute for what seems to be troublesome problem in your radio. And uh, that, uh, that's how you diagnose the trouble, and that's how you fix it. And uh, if force came to worse, you would steal the circuit out of this unit and put it in the radio and make, and make the, uh, the homeowner quite happy and make Hickok happy because you had to buy a new one of these things. Uh, they, they aren't very convenient. And I don't, I don't highly recommend them. I think it's better to uh, to break it down into individual signal generator and a signal analyzer, like a scope <coughs> and a meter, and be done with it. Next slide. So these are the things we feed it with, and I already told you about that. There's the Kronheit signal generator. And the isolation transformer, imagine it to be here. That's, that's a picture of the one I, I was going to use. It's one I made up uh, out of uh, a good transformer and a, and a cabinet. And if you can just barely see on the far side, there's a, a switch and a fuse and a pilot light. So it tells you that it's on. And, uh, and the fuse, of course, will will actually protect it and you from danger in case the radio has a short in it. Next slide. But we mentioned that for diagnosis using a scope, and you may have to go out and get one because maybe you don't have any. Or maybe you have one and it isn't uh, one of the new transistor, one of the newer transistorized ones, 
and uses tubes like some of the old uh, uh, Tektronics units, which are now available real cheap, and they're extremely heavy, and you have to buy up a spare set of tubes for them when you buy them because uh, most of them have the same tubes in them that Tektronics put in in the factory. Uh, they, they are very easy on tubes, but the tubes are not standard tubes. They aren't like 6SN7s and so on. They're, they're all miniatures and they're all in the 5000 series class. So it's, it's a little bit of a problem getting tubes for them in some cases. So I would stick with transistorized ones and stick with good brands. Tektronix makes, makes some very good scopes. And some of the things you want to make sure of are that they have more than one channel of vertical deflection. You, you're always going to need two channels at the very least and possibly four channels if you are into uh, checking things like computers as well as uh, uh, radios and amplifiers. <clears throat> and, and don't ever buy one that doesn't have two good probes with it if it's a two-channel unit. One good probe if it's a one-channel unit, but I don't recommend that and four probes if it's a four channel unit because you're going to need them all four and they should be all of the same brand and the same type these are Tektronix brands here the ones on that scope came with the scope and I have others with me like uh, Hewlett Packard and they're used interchangeably you can use the Tektronix ones on that scope and on the HP scope, they almost all have the same input impedance. And what do these things do? Well, they, they couple the signal probe to the scope. And if you just did that with a piece of coaxial cable, you would lose most of the signal getting there. And you'd also have a high capacitance applied to the object that you're measuring because this cable has a capacitance of 30 micro microfarads per foot. So if it's uh, three feet long, it's going to have almost 100 puffs uh, of capacitance. So you don't want to put that on your circuit. So in the probe itself, there's, there's more isolation. There's a r resistor of probably 10 mega ohms or more. And there's a capacitor across it of about seven or eight puffs. And that's how much capacitance you're applying to the circuit when you measure it. Only seven puffs and 10 megs. So it doesn't affect the circuit very much. You can actually, we'll actually test that when we're looking at the radio. Uh, you'll see that when you apply the, the, uh, the scope probe, it, it hardly makes the radio twitch. It doesn't change its uh, waveforms at all. And that's a very important thing about these probes. Now, some of them come with a switch on them, like this scope came with a switch probe, the little black switch, which changes it from times one to times 10. Uh, normally, they come only in size times 10, which means that they cut the signal down by a factor of 10. And that's a necessary trade-off you have to make to keep the loading down so that you don't load, load your own circuit down. So mentally, you have to add 10 dB or, or rather 20 dB to the voltage, which means that you have to multiply it by a factor of 10. And most people can do that in their head. <laughs> well, some people can do that in their head. Well, a few yes. people can do that in their head. Okay. Ed, I noticed on that slide, can you bring up the slide again, Dave? Sure. You don't have HP as one of the brands? No. Um, one of the problems with buying some of the early HP solid state units was they were storage scopes. 
and people will try to unload one of those on you first before they load, uh, they unload a good scope. And storage scopes, had a, all the storage was in the screen in the Hewlett Packard brand. Uh, more, more recently, they make a digital scope now. They don't call it Hewlett Packard, it's called Keysight, but uh, it's the same company. Uh, but the, the modern scopes, like this old one, is a digital scope, and it has a lot of memory too. Um, as a matter of fact, the whole thing works on memory. It is a, it's just a huge memory uh, and a little bit of a computational tool. Um, that's the main difference between the analog scopes you see in the right-hand side and the upper side and this Ovon down here, which is a digital. I show an Ovon because I happen to have bought one of those. And the strangest thing happened to it. It was slow to boot up one day. And when it booted up, everything came out in Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> and it will not go back to English. And the booklet that comes with it says that it will adapt to any, any language you want and it lists about 30 languages. Uh, but mine's stuck on Chinese. So uh, <laughs> if I find a proper nationality person, I'm gonna try to sell it. <laughs> I don't know anybody else who, uh, who would want it. So, uh, so the bottom line is, I don't want to buy a digital scope again because I found out the way they work is they take in the signal in memory and they analyze the hell out of it. They'll, they'll do an FFT on it, which tells you what all the frequency components are, and it's very democratic, it lists them all. So if you have any distortion in the signal, it's gonna tell you all the, all the signal components of the, the, that are in the signal, all their frequencies. And uh, you don't wanna know that most of the time. <laughs> if you're fixing a radio, you wanna know several frequencies like the local oscillator, uh, the IF and uh, the incoming frequency, and maybe check out the audio. You want to make sure that it is relatively flat across the audio band and things like that. But you don't want to know all about the little blip that, that occurred when you measured things, and the uh, damn scope analyzed the, the living devil out of it. So. I, I would not recommend starting off with a digital scope. I would, I would recommend going with an analog transistorized scope, <coughs> mainly because you can carry it. The, the, the tube ones are very hard to carry. They're extremely heavy. Uh, the fact that Tektronix made carts for them uh, was not just an advertising ploy. <laughs> they were trying to save your life. So next slide talks about the one after that, this, this one here. <clears throat> it compares the analog and digital scopes and how they work. And uh, the digital scopes certainly can cover a wider frequency range and a huge range of prices from $175 to $175,000. And uh, they'll read uh, signals up to I think higher even, even than three gigahertz, probably up to 10 gigahertz. And it outputs all, almost everything as a typed value, uh, a numerical value. Uh, it, and the wave shape often has little glitches and things in it, which is caused by, partly by the signal itself and partly by the scope switching between things because it's doing uh, an awful lot of things at one time. Uh, the, and the wave shapes are somewhat synthetic. They, aren't, they are not really the wave shape of the signal that you're looking at, but they're, they are what it, what it has analyzed the signal to look like. So it has to reproduce the signal out of memory, and it does that the, the best it can. It all depends upon how good uh, the scope is, and the really expensive ones 
do a very good job. The cheaper ones, like the old one that I bought, which was about $175, uh, do not do a good job. So I would stick with analog for, the, for my first scope, if I were you, and maybe even the second scope. Next, next slide. The, uh, the scope we're using here is a uh, BK Precision, which was made at one time in America, but I think now they're made in Europe somewhere. I'm not sure where this one was made. Uh, I bought it uh, used for something like a hundred and a quarter, and uh, it has worked quite well. It has two channels, and we're going to look at the controls, and that's the thing that scares most people about scopes when they first are put into a, a position of having to use one. See, there's a difference between us guys in the, in the radio business here. A lot of us got into it after we were adults, and we had a full life ahead of that. We had a business life or whatever we did for a living, and this is kind of a semi-retirement thing. And so when we're faced with a scope which has all those controls on it, it's like going back to a 1920s radio. It's only a 12-year-old can operate it. And um, so, so it's kind of challenging to try to understand what all those buttons and knobs mean. And they try to minimize the, the number of them and often that, that it makes it more confusing because they, they use multiple purposes for, them, for, for a given knob. That's especially true in the digital units. You may only have five buttons on the front of a digital unit and they have uh, 50 or 60 different possible uses. And uh, Lord help you, if you push it at the wrong time, you'll, uh, you'll, you'll do something to the waveform that you were trying to save. So let's go over the... Uh, the controls here. The next slide will show a blow up of the controls. Okay. Do we have a pointer? No. No. No, I guess not. Wait a minute, I do. Okay. <laughs> there are controls over no, under the screen which control the screen itself. How bright you want it, uh, whether it's focused or not, because it is a cathode ray tube. And uh, and the illumination of the gradical. The gradical is the. Uh, you have <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the, uh, the gradical is is uh, that set of markings every centimeter on the screen, and most things are labeled here in units per division, and they call these marks divisions on the screen. So, if in your vertical inputs, you have two vertical inputs, one blue and one red. Uh, this is channel one, channel two. This is the coax that feeds the input signals in. This is the gain control on the input. And it's actually labeled in volts and millivolts per square. So if you set it for one tenth of a volt per square, it's going to give you that sensitivity on the screen. So you can read a signal on the screen and look at how many centimeters high it is, and it tells you how many volts are in the signal. Channel one is separate from channel two. They're, they're independent of each other. But you can do certain combinations with the upper control of the buttons here. Those buttons are either pushed in or they pop out. When they're in, this symbol means in, and it's all these bottom meanings. Number one channel is inverted. When it's pushed in, you're looking only at channel two. If, it's, if this is pushed in, you're looking at both channels, dual channels. If this is pushed in, and this one, if you push it in, it will either chop between the channels and give you a high speed look at both channels 
five time sampling, it jumps to one and then the other, and it does it so fast you can't tell it isn't a continuous reading. Or it will add the two channels. So if it adds the two channels, that means whatever's coming in this channel, that signal gets added to this channel. And that's very, very handy. If you want to check a transmitter, for example, you can put the voice modulation signal in here and look at the RF signal here, and you can see a voice thing on top of the actual uh, RF signal, and that's what the envelope should look like. And if it doesn't, you do some, some uh, work on the modulator. <coughs> so that's what those buttons are for. This one, up and down position, that's in case the, the, two, the two signals are interfering with each other by one writing on top of the other. You can always move one out of the way. And there's also a thing here called signal finder that tells you where you moved it to, because sometimes you lose it and you, you lose track of where, where you put it. I put it on the top, so I'll bring it back down. Okay, uh, can everybody see this screen? It's been, I guess some of you can, can move it on that, stand sure. here. All right, um, we're going on with the controls. Back to that slide. You want to go back to your slide? Okay. <coughs> there, this is a clearer picture. So that takes care of the vertical controls. And all these controls work the vertical the deflection. We have a calibrator here which puts out a standard two tenths of a volt peak to peak square wave. And that's what we were looking at earlier here when we had one of these uh, looking at this thing. There's a little hook on the end, which you can hook on there now. That's a square wave, and it doesn't look like it. Why? That's our next step. We're getting back to okay. Go back. Go back. the controls. We have to go up here and look at the uh, what we call the trigger controls. This is always a time base across from left to right. So the horizontal is always a time base. And you have to tell the time base when to start. You have to tell it how fast to go across there. Those are two very important points. You can make it go across very quickly, so it only goes through one sine wave at the frequency you chose. Or you can go across very slowly, so it goes through many, many cycles. This is the speed control on that, that or the, uh, the uh, centimeters per second. But the trigger controls are the important things that tell it when to start. Sometimes you have a problem with a radio that uh, when you first turn it on, there's a loud pop in the speaker or something and you want to know what is causing that. Uh, you're going to want to start the sweep just as the pop occurs. You don't want to do it between pops because you'll, you'll miss it. And, and the screen will have uh, swept across and uh, the pop is gone. So you have to do it again. And you're, every time you do it, you're worried that you're going to hurt your speaker. So you don't want to have to repeat it forever. So you want to trigger this thing to start on a certain, certain event. You can make it start. Sorry. <laughs> go back to the next slide. There we go. You, you, you can make it start by choosing how you couple a signal to the starting point. And this is the thing that starts it. Is external trigger goes into that coax. It's, it, is, it is normally a coaxial connection. I, I convert it to a two-wire connection so that you can see things a lot more clearly. 
so you can choose how you couple the signal in, whether it's just the AC part of the signal or you want the DC part also. So you pick AC or DC or, or low frequency or high frequency AF, uh, high, high frequency AC. Now why would you go to a high frequency wrong if you had multiple frequencies present? Let's say you had uh, a mixture of a lot of signals, like an audio signal from, uh, of music. Would you want it to sync on, uh, on the piccolo uh, notes when they occur, or on the drums, or on the tuba, or what? You, 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 you can pick which waveform you want it to actually sync on. I got it. I'll leave it on. There it is. So you can choose low frequency or high frequency, and line, that means it's 60 hertz. It, uh, it, it's this switch here, and now it's only looking at 60 hertz thing. That is, it's starting at the same point on the 60 hertz curve. So it's very good for looking at, at the power line related problems like hum in a receiver. Okay. Go back to the screen. Back to the screen again, okay. Now, the source of where the signal comes from, do you want to have to plug it in or do you want to, it to pick it off from your, your probes? When you pick it off from the probes, you have a choice of channel one, channel two, alternating between channel one and channel two, or external, which means you can do this thing. So you can have an external signal, which, in, which is what I have here. I have my signal generator feeding not only my circuit in question, but I have sneaked these two wires over to feed the external trigger. Now if I put this on external, oh, you, 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 you keep taking that away. <laughs> We try to see what you're doing on the scope, and then we try to see what you're doing okay. on the chain. Okay. So, so the source is now channel one. I can go to channel two, and that locks it to the square wave, because that's what we're looking at with channel two is 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 the square wave. We can alternate between them, which means the two channels can each be synced. Or I can lock it to external, which means it only is sunk on the uh, on the sine wave now. And I'll always keep the sine wave looking stationary. It is now too, but you can't see it until I speed it up. sink and this thing. So he's speeding this up. Oh, I went to a really high frequency one. There it is. These buttons are getting a little bit sticky. There it is. So uh, the square wave is not in sync now, but the sine wave is, because the sine wave is coming from here, and that's where the trigger is coming from to tell this thing when to sweep. If I go to channel two to sweep instead, let's say we to channel two right there, and I have to slow it down somewhat, because we only had one square wave showing. So now the square wave is nice and steady, but this is not because this is independent of the square wave and we have chosen to look at the square wave. So, so those are the important controls that you have to worry about. The speed control here for the uh, horizontal is kind of obvious. 
And there's another thing you can do in this scope, but not all scopes have it. They have a delay. You can put a delay ahead of it, and then it'll sleep at this speed. And uh, the delay can be chosen. And it's much in microseconds or milliseconds. Let's see, any other controls through the horizontal motion control here, which is good for looking intently at the beginning or the end of something. And uh, that's about all of the important controls that you have to worry about. This main time base is the speed I talked about, and this is the delay. There's position controls, therefore moving up and down. This is for the B channel, and this is for the A channel. All right, now let's get into some diagnosis of problems. We have a receiver here, and we're going to break it out pretty soon. We have a couple of slides. Uh, I'm falling behind a couple of slides. Okay, next slide. Now the one after this. We can do a little quick test with the uh, scope just to show the, uh, the kind of thing you can do with a scope and a sig signal generator. I have a thing here called a delay line. It has an input, an output, uh, and a common ground between them so that you can actually feed this signal generator instead of just over here to these clip leads, I'll feed it into this this device, this delay line. This is this is a popular thing during World War II. And I'm just using parallel wires for uh, feeding rather than coax so you can you can actually see the, uh, the connections. So this is the input, and this one goes to ground. So I have a signal going into that delay line. Now I'm going to use my scope, both channels, if I can untangle the wires. Channel A will look at the input. That is, it will be looking at the sine wave going into this kludge. And channel B will be looking at the output. I don't have to use the ground because I already have a ground. So I'm looking at the output. Now both of these are sine waves. And I can have a triggering on number A on the input. And, uh, so you can see they're both sine waves, but they're pretty high frequency, so we'll go up here to where they're, they're both showing. And notice that they're in opposite phase from each other, and they don't stay that way. As a matter of fact, you'll see one is delayed compared to the other. And the way you can tell that is to move them both on top of each other. You see one occurs before the other. And the amount of time between the, the two peaks is staying the same. And right now they're exactly opposite each other. So this delay line could tell you exactly what frequency that is. <coughs> because the time it takes a, a wave to go a half a wavelength is the amount of time that's in this delay line. So all I have to do is know this frequency, which happens to be 10,000 times 450. So it's uh, four and a half, let's see, 10,000 times 450 would be 450,000 cycles per second. So it's 450 kilohertz. 
So what's the what's the period of 450 kilohertz? Uh, we have to. That turns out to be two two point something microseconds. So the delay here is a full microsecond, and and that's what this delay line is. So. That shows uh, some of the things you can do with a scope is to see how long it takes a signal to get through an amplifier, for example, or through a, uh, uh, the, uh, the preamp with all of its adjustments in the, uh, of the spectrum. I have another one of those things. We could put two of them in series. And you see, it would be just, it would just double the line, uh, the length of time between them. So, so that's just an example of, of of what a scope shows naturally. It shows delay time between two things by by putting them both on the same screen. Now, we could have done one other thing that's even more interesting than that. I, I shouldn't have taken this off that fast. Uh, we have our input going in here, and we're looking at right now here. Awesome. Input still going there. Now A is going to look at the input. Channel B is going to look at the output. And I need a ground. Where's the ground? There it is. All right, now we get the signal back. There's one other thing we can, we can do now that we have them both on the screen. We could add the two. We could uh, make them both turn out to be on the same thing. And there I've added them, and they add to practically zero. Because if you notice, one was going up while the other one was going down, so they are actually at zero. But if I change the frequency, it comes back. There I have them two exactly canceled out, which means the delay line here is exactly half of the waveform in time length. Now it's interesting to look to see if there's any lower frequency where that occurs. It looks like there is not. And that's the first place it occurs. Now it should occur as I go to higher frequencies because the higher the frequency, the more often you'll pass through another null. There's another null. There's another one. Not quite as good, which means that there's enough distortion in a waveform going through this line that uh, any of the distortion shows up as a result. So that's the sort of thing we can do with, <coughs> with a two-channel scope, is add the two together. And when you do that, You can tell when signals exactly cancel out or when they're exactly the same. And, and that's very important when you're doing audio work. If you're measuring the left channel or right channel in a, in a stereo system, you want them to have the same delay. You want them to have the same waveform. Uh, and, uh, and so the scope can actually be set in the adding mode like it is now. And it'll add the two channels. And when you do that, 
you can see that if there's any, anything uh, that is residual, then it's, it's something different between the two channels. And that would be very handy in an audio amplifier analysis, if, you, if that's what your job was. But we're going to be looking at this cheap radio. And uh, I have done something since I lost my isolation transformer. What I did is carefully chose which way I plugged the radio in using an ohmmeter to make sure that the B minus was going to the ground side of this thing. And I'm going to plug it in and we can actually look at some of the, uh, the uh, waveform. Oops. Hello. <laughs> But this radio uh, probably doesn't play in here. Very, very few things work in this environment here. So we're going to start checking some voltages and some <coughs> waveforms. One of the things we can do is, using channel A, for example, We'll take a look and see if the local oscillator is moving. Let's we'll see if it's really working. And uh, this should not spark when I touch the B minus with it. If I have any luck at all. Where is it? Oh, here it is. Uh, this is B minus. So I do get some buzzing. And uh, <coughs> you can look at that waveform right there up to channel A. <coughs> so we'll go to channel one and we'll go with that frequency. AC is good. There's some 60 hertz stuff there. That's some of the buzzing. So a local oscillator doesn't look like it's operating. Now, so this thing may or may not have good B voltage. The, the B voltage has an awful lot of 60 hertz on it. That's a 60 hertz. Thing I can tell that for sure by going to line C. And it's 60 hertz, meaning that this, uh, this filter capacitor is probably not very good. So we've isolated the noise in the receiver to a bad filter capacitor. And one of the things we could do, I suppose, is put, a, put another filter capacitor across it to see if it'll uh, quiet it down. Now the way you do that is you get a filter capacitor and you clip it from B minus to B plus. And I'll put this in the same place. using the scope to turn it on and off. <laughs> that, that's how safe the circuit is. Uh, that should have called known some of that 60 hertz. And it did. Now we can actually take a look at the uh, local oscillator. Yeah, 
Very little 60 hertz hum on it now. So the local oscillator in this thing is not working. Probably is a tube. 12 SA7. So we pointed out two of the problems of the set. One of them is the filter capacitor was shot. And the second one is the 12SA7 is bad. There are a lot of other areas you can check that up too. Uh, the audio, and incidentally, the audio in the, in this set doesn't agree with riders. Um, I had to trace it out that there's a, a, a feedback system in it, which 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 the riders doesn't show. Uh, and they only made a few of these radios, and they only made radios for two years. <coughs> uh, so, or, or why they didn't give riders a good data, I don't have any idea. So, let's just go on with the uh, diagnosis and, Ed, Ed, we got and the capabilities we got here. Question, here. question, yeah. And, uh, since you don't, since you don't have an isolation transformer, yeah. Where did you connect the ground lead of the, your test equipment? On the B minus or on the chassis? Well, I should have tied it to something independent of the power line, but I didn't have any choice here because the uh, 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 the circuit in this in this radio had it going to to a chassis as well. Uh, there was an isolation resistor in there, but somebody had wired it out. I have no idea why it, um, the, the, uh, the, the the power cord is is kind of old and tired also, so it could be that that, that he had intermittent contact in the wall, so so he grounded it anyhow. So so he made it a hot chassis set, which is not very good. Uh, if you, if you and I just made sure that that was on on the ground side of the uh, or on the neutral side of the power line, so I wouldn't get electrocuted. But, uh, but it doesn't keep it from having sneak circuits like turning itself on when you ground it to the scope. Because yeah. the scope is grounded and, and that eventually goes to the, the neutral as well. So one of the other things we can, we can do with the scope, which is pretty handy, is if you have in your junk box a bunch of old IF cans and you don't know whether they're any good or not, and what frequency they're for, because oftentimes the labels have been eaten up by mice or something, or, or age, and you can't read them. Uh, I have a whole slew of those, and I've been able to go through them with the scope and the signal generator, and just find out what frequency they are, and then label them. And, uh, and they come in handy if you're doing some repairs, and you find uh, a bad one in a set like it has uh, that solar disease or, or, or some other serious problem like a shorted turn or something. And uh, shorted turns are very hard to find, but sometimes uh, you find them and they sure do affect the IF uh, pass band. Okay, um, well, let's go on with the uh, prepared talk. Next slide after this is the schematic and, and that's the schematic that Ryder shows and then the next slide shows the changes in the output that I traced and it had some feedback added to it and I don't know why it had the feedback but the other problem this radio had was the capacitor that 0.01 um, which feeds the grid of the 50L6 was leaky. 
and I had about six volts positive on the grid of the, of the 50L6. And that was a cause of a lot of troubles um, because it made the 50L6 draw so much current that it made the V plus quite low. And then the local oscillator quit. And, and that's why the local oscillator quit. Uh, the, 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 the 12A uh, SA7 was just weak, that's all. And it needed a full V plus to get the oscillator going. Okay, next slide. Okay, this is the point I made about time and frequency. Uh, they always measure things as a function of time, and it's a really direct measurement, too. It tells you right on this knob that this thing is moving at uh, 5 milliseconds per marking, or per division. And, 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 and you can take that to the bank. Uh, that's a very accurate time base in almost all scopes. Um, after the Heath kits, of course. Uh, the, uh, the Heath kits, uh, very few of them, just the last two models measured things in time. They ordinarily measured them in sweeps per second, which is a useless thing. It doesn't tell you anything about, about the circuit you're measuring. So, next slide. It just goes through the math you have to do to change time to frequency if you want to know what the frequency is. And it, it, it's simple, it's just one over the, uh, the other. And you can use a, a cell phone or a handheld calculator, which I always keep handy just to, to, to make sure I'm, I'm, I'm not going crazy and seeing things wrong. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the rest of this presentation on the radio itself uh, simply goes through telling you that you can measure DC voltages with the scope as well. Uh, we could do that here. Um, we'll use channel A again for that. I'll connect it to the uh, B minus again if I can find it. And wait till it warms up. And I'll show you what happens when you measure uh, you know, This thing would be easier if it were upside down. place that had 60 hertz on it. Well, let's take a look and see what... This is the plate of the IF tube. It has a lot of hex, uh, uh, 60 hertz on it. That's because I don't have that filter capacitor in there now. But what is that actual voltage? One thing we can measure is either AC, just looking at the AC part of it, or the DC part. And if the DC part is being measured, then we have to uh, Set this in a convenient spot, like down here on this line. Hook this up to the plate again. And it jumped up two lines. Approximately four and a half lines. And the voltage is reading two volts per per division. So the the B plus 
has sagged all the way down to two, four, six, eight, three to like ten volts on the plate of the IF tube, and it should be more like 70 volts or 60 volts. And that's because there, there isn't any any B plus filter around. Uh, that I, that uh, ice uh, electrolytic must be uh, just about dry. So you can measure DC as well as AC with a scope. And you can measure DC that has AC on top of it, just like we did. OK. Notice that if you want to look at AC, you have to choose whether you want the waveform to freeze and therefore use your line uh, synchronization or internal synchronization. That is, whatever signal comes in channel A will be the thing that it walks on. Like, for example, let's get this up in the middle here. If I go to line. This is the pickup now for my finger. I notice that it's a frozen 60 hertz sine wave. That's because I have it on line sync. If I were to sync it on something else, it wouldn't stay still. All right, let's turn this off again. I wouldn't want that capacitor to blow up. It would be very bad. Okay, so if you use the scope to make an analysis of a circuit like that, you can measure all of the voltages throughout the set. You can see which ones have other signals on top of them, which ones are clean, and, and we saw that the B plus signal in this thing was not very clean. It had an awful lot of 60 hertz on it, meaning we did need that extra capacitor. And uh, so we, we really should change this electrolytic. And I think changing the electrolytic and changing the coupling capacitor to the output tube, which also was leaky, uh, because it allowed six volts to occur on the grid of the output tube, that, that would make that radio play pretty well. So, so that's a sort of analysis you can do using a scope as well as a voltmeter to measure things throughout a set. Um, I've, I've worked with an awful lot of the MARC members who do their own repairs and they, uh, we do an awful lot of repairs together uh, by email. I have maybe, oh, five or six messages a week on uh, on repairing radios and in 80 percent of the time the, the repairman does not use a scope and it's very difficult for him to understand that it's so easy to use a scope just to make one measurement and it'll tell you whether it needs a filter capacitor whether there's something else driving the the, the b plus down or, or not, and, and, and you'll find leaky capacitors of the, of the same way. You'll find that you'll have the same DC voltage on both sides of the capacitor, and that's not what the capacitor was for, uh, and it's obviously leaking. Uh, so, so I would highly recommend using a scope and getting used to it so that it becomes the first thing you go for when you're going to repair something. And it's especially useful in the case of audio amplifiers. And if I had been uh, uh, thinking straight, I would have used an audio amplifier for a, uh, a victim here because uh, most audio amplifiers are not AC-DC. <laughs> At least none of the ones that I've, I've ever handled. So I have uh, some time yet left. Does anybody have any questions they want to ask about? especially about scopes, signal generators, or, or meters. Yeah. Yes? I 
picked up a dual tray scope, but I only had one probe, so I've got to get a, a matching probe. Is there any way to tell what the impedance of the probe I had is? Uh, what brand is it? HP. HP? Yeah. Um, yeah, you, you can use any HP scope probe or you can use a Tektronix probe. Uh, the reading might be very slightly off, but uh, it'll be essentially the same. Now, the HP probe is sometimes a much longer cord. I don't know, is yours real long? Well, it's about standard, okay. so. Because uh, uh, HP made some very, very long leads on, 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 on some of theirs, and uh, so they do reflect more capacitance into the uh, circuit because the amount you can reduce the capacitance is not more than about 10. Because you don't want to put too much attenuation in the probe, otherwise, you lose all the small signals. So. Uh, uh, if it's a regular HP probe, you can use a Tektronix probe, or if you can find an HP probe, use one of those. I'm, I may have an extra HP probe up here, I'm, I'm not too sure. Now, the, I, have, I have extra Tektronix probes. I don't think I brought any HP probes. No, sorry, I didn't bring one with me. I've, I've, uh, I've got a couple HP probes. If you uh, send me an email, I'll mail you one. We'll talk. Yes. What in the back. Way in the back. Yes. What uh, bandwidth would you recommend for someone starting out for a oscilloscope? I mean, how low? I mean, I don't want to buy one too low. I'm sorry, I didn't know, uh, what, what, what brand would I buy? No, no like bandwidth. bandwidth like oh, bandwidth? Yes, yeah, well, it, it all depends on what kind of repairs you do. If you're working with uh, FM sets, you'll need up to 10.7 megahertz for sure. So I would get a 50 or 60 megahertz set. You don't have to look at the RF signal very often. Uh, with a scope, uh, but you do have to look at the IF, and so uh, you have to be able to cover the IF of the of, of of any of the things you're working on. Now, if you're working on transmitters, uh, ham transmitters or something like that, you're going to want one that goes up to at least 50 or 100 megahertz. All right. Thank you. Because you're going to want to look at the at the waveform that you're putting out on the antenna. Because that's what the FCC does, <laughs> and you don't want them to, do, to to be one step ahead of you. Anybody else? Yes. Did, did you explain the difference between a dual trace and a dual beam scope? Dual beam. Uh, a t dual beam had two actual cathode rays or cathode rays in it, so it actually. Uh, had independent deflections of those beams. So uh, they were, they're much more rare. And uh, you'll find them useful about one out of 50 times that you use a scope. Uh, because you'll want two things that sweep differently and because they're, and that, that came in handy in computer work. Because you'll have things that are occurring at a very high rate and you want to see what the waveform looks like. You have also things that that triggers further down the line that is at a low rate. And you're going to want to see uh, uh, how that behaves as, as well. And so you'll need either two scopes uh, that have the same kind of sync and uh, they look at different speeds, or get a two-beam scope, which you'll use to fix that problem, and then you'll put it away again for another five years. <laughs> yes? Yeah, I just recently picked up the Tektronix 468. 468? Yeah, and it had three probes, two which just looked like normal probes, and a third one which had, I'm thinking, a higher resistance, 
It's like a rectangular box on it. Yeah, um, they made a yeah they made a different uh, type of adjustment. See, all of these probes have an adjustment in them. Uh, that if it's if the adjustment is wrong, the square wave will not be very square. We'll take a look at that here. Put this up here, channel uh, A. <coughs> Can you see how nice and square that is? Mm -hmm. I can actually adjust this one. tool for adjusting it here again. This is, uh, I can show you better on, on the Tektronix scope probe. Tektronix probes almost always adjust right at this base here. This thing unscrews and rotates and then you tighten it back up and when you use this probe You'll see these are rounded on the corners, or there are sharp spikes on the corners. So they won't be square waves. They'll be either with a spike on top, or they'll be rounded. If they're rounded, then they're not passing the high frequencies. And if they have a spike on top, they're not passing the low frequencies e evenly. And, and this adjusts a capacitor inside. So there's an adjustment there, and uh, almost all Tektronix oscilloscope books will tell you about that. So if you get a, a Tektronix scope, you can get any Tektronix book uh, from almost any other scope of the same general class, and they'll tell you how to adjust the probes. Well, I'm assuming that that box-like, uh, it's a rectangular. Yeah, at, uh, HP put theirs in a little box too. Mm -hmm. uh, there wasn't room to put it in the uh, probe itself. They put it on a little box at the um, other end of the cord, usually. I didn't bring my HP probes here, unfortunately. But that's the main difference between HP and uh, Tektronix. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay, thank you very much.